Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Eons of Battle. I have been going through my year of hobbying and looking at the tools that I have purchased and which ones have made their way to my painting desk and I can no longer live without. Some things have changed the way I hobby. Some things are just little quality of life upgrades, but each one of them has become invaluable. And a few dishonorable mentions at the end. Starting off list with probably the most boring thing that I use absolutely every single day. It might sound a little weird, but a little shot glass full of toothpicks. I always am reaching for toothpicks, and right now I have all of my wood tools inside of a bin, and so often I'm yanking that sucker out, opening it up, digging for a toothpick, and then putting it back and closing it up. Because I always need toothpicks to push glue around or to pry or squeeze plastic minis into the perfect shape. Sometimes I glue them down to my table to support a mini while the glue is drying. I always need toothpicks, and so having just a bunch of them sitting there on my desk in a little shot glass, it doesn't take up any room. I don't know why I didn't do it years and years ago, but it is super, super handy, and it has never left my desk. I refilled it twice. I go through a lot of toothpicks. They are invaluable, and it is one of my favorite things that is on my hobby desk just because of its simplicity, just because of how much use I actually get out of this tiny little thing. But speaking of things that are not tiny at all, miniature storage is somewhat impossible. I have minis scattered to the four corners of my house, and it does kind of negatively affect the hobby because it feels like nothing is done. Also, very often things aren't done, but recently I got a Jakoshi case and I liked it so much that I actually got a second one and every mini inside of the Jakoshi cases are finished and they feel finished. They feel all wrapped up in a nice little bow and it's just so nice and it's such a good feeling to have them put away nicely and I can easily transport them to and from my local game store to play games with. It's so handy to actually have a an actual place that is dedicated only to storing finished miniatures. And I would get five more. I love the Jakoshi case. Really any case would get the job done, but it's super nice. It's got a door on there. It's got little drawers to slide models into. Sometimes I'll just take a drawer with me if I want to touch something up. It is super handy to actually have a dedicated miniature storage case. But speaking of finishing miniatures, one thing that I bought on a whim is a new paintbrush. Well, I bought a bunch of new paintbrushes from Rosemary & Co, where I usually get my paintbrushes. I like their synthetic brushes a lot. And on a whim, as I was checking out, I decided to throw onto the cart a, a starter pack of synthetic brushes. And most of, the, most of the pack was what you'd expect, like a size zero to a size three, which is what most people use for painting. But it also went all the way up to a size 10 and 12. And shockingly, the size 10 and 12 are totally usable paintbrushes. They have a nice sharp tip and the monstrous size actually means that base coating isn't as painful as it tends to be. I always try to avoid base coating as much as I possibly can. I use a lot of airbrush, I use a lot of washes. Sometimes I'll even like dunk wash a model in paint just to get some color on there without me having to fuss with it. But a gigantic paintbrush, like a si the size 10, I use a fair amount and it is really nice. It also holds a monstrous amount of paint. I am very bad about cleaning my brush. Like you should clean your brush every like, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds. Sometimes I'll go for like 10 minutes because <laughs> I'll just take my paintbrush and I'll kind of dip it in the palette water that I have just to kind of refresh the paint a little bit instead of properly wiping it clean and starting over with more paint. But it actually works and it works really well with the gigantic bristles of a size pen paintbrush. I almost want to experiment with how long I can go without cleaning the paintbrush. Like, can I go an hour just with cheating it and refreshing and getting a little bit more water on the brush? maybe wiping it on a little paper towel to get off excess paint to change colors. Like, do I ever have to properly clean my paintbrush? I bet I don't. I bet I could get through an entire painting session with one paintbrush, especially one that is really, really big. When I started painting, I would always use the microscopic little artsy fartsy paintbrushes, and those are not very good because the paint dries so quickly. But not having to refresh paint all the time leads to more blending. It leads to more kind of painting discoveries. I've been doing a lot more wet blending and a lot more layering. 
It's been really, really fun. And I actually have not been using the brushes I know I like that I restocked from Rosemary & Co because I've been using these gigantic synthetic brushes more. But speaking of getting brushes nice and clean, well, not necessarily brushes, but I bought a proper ultrasonic cleaner. It is two quarts and it actually has a built-in heater. I do a lot of retro models and a lot of resin work. And so it's really nice to have a proper ultrasonic cleaner. I knew I needed one when I bought a little glasses cleaner, ultrasonic cleaner, and I used it all the time. It was never dry. I was always cleaning stuff off. Sometimes I would clean my airbrushes. I was cleaning just random tools, other just things I happen to own. It's actually a really handy little piece of kit. I thought it was gonna be a gimmick or just not really do the job because why would a little shaken make things really clean? But it really, really works. And now that I have one with a heater, I've tested it out on some of my old junkiest metal models and it takes the paint off. It definitely limits the amount of scrubbing required to get old models really clean. Every now and then you run into like a eBay lot or something where whatever primer they used is the greatest primer in the history of the world and it will not come off. But I've definitely had it knock all of the probably Games Workshop paint that was on the model. All of that comes off and then it's back down to the original primer and the original primer layer is still decent because whatever paint that is, it is bulletproof. So an actual ultrasonic cleaner with a heater is really nice. And that heater gets hot. The ultrasonic cleaner I bought was a little on the expensive side. I think it was like 60 bucks. And there's other ones that you can get that are thousands of dollars if you want like a tub, an actual tub of ultra to clean things ultrasonically. You could probably clean yourself ultrasonically, although that might be dangerous. I don't know exactly what the shaking or the vibrations do, but they do a good job. But speaking of things that don't do a good job, I got myself a proper Vortex mixer, or rather I didn't. I bought one for $25 because I, I've been painting for 10 years, for over 10 years, and I've always just shaken my paint, just shake them up, never had a problem. I've never had paint go bad on me. I've never had this stuff. I mean, you get clogs with dropper bottles and stuff all the time, but I've never had just taking the paint and just shake it in my hands, not do the job. But I always hear, Everyone say you need a proper Vortex mixer. You need that to shake the paint. And so I spent 25 bucks and I bought the cheapest ultrasonic or the cheapest um, paint shaker on Amazon. And it was trash. It did not do anything. I tried super thick like Vallejo and Games Workshop paints. I tried really, really thin Pro Acryl paints and it just it was garbage. So I decided I, I this is not I'm not running a proper experiment. I bought the worst product out there, so I should get a real one. And so I got a real one and they really do work. I mean, it's laboratory equipment. It really should work, but I have been using it a ton. I'm worried it was expensive and I'm worried it'll burn out because it's just a motor in there. So I don't know. It's a little I, I've been using it for four or five months now and it's been doing it's been running like a clock it's great it does mix the paints it does struggle a little tiny bit with thicker paints like games workshop paints or vallejo paints i have some very old army painter paints that have probably lost a lot of moisture and they're soup like they're they're campbell's thick chicken noodle like it's crazy how thick the paint is and it, it can't quite stir that up but i've added in a little bit of water and i add in like a i have a baggie of river rocks that i got from the arts and crafts store i dropped those into my paint too and with with you know working on it i did get it back up back up and running so an old a vortex mixer a proper vortex mixer completely superfluous purchase you can totally get by without one it doesn't do anything extra it's just, it's, it's just shaking the paint. It's just mixing your paint for you. Although I have, I have these little um, condiment cups that I sometimes do mixes in. And so I've actually mixed paint into the condiment cups, put a little plastic lid on there and then put that on the vortex mixer. And it does make up a solution. It properly mixes it and gets it all nice. So that's one thing. I mean, I guess I could do that normally just by hand, but it's really nice. It's a really nice little quality of life upgrade that it's probably not worth like you should probably just get like a really nice model and then just shake your paints for a little bit. But I've really been enjoying the Vortex Mixer. And speaking of things I've been enjoying, one thing I sort of haven't been enjoying lately is 
my progress on getting models done. I have been cranking through stuff, trying to get my 40K armies up and running. I was playing tons of kill team and kill teams are super easy because you can just crank them out in like a weekend, get 10 guys painted. It's not, it's not a huge project, but I have so many 40K projects going on at once that I get nothing done. Very often I'll sit down at the end of a day of painting and I'll be like, all right, now it's time for the me painting. Now it's time for me to work on what I want. And so then I really start to ponder. I'm like, what do I feel like doing now? What what is Jimmy and my jams? What is Flim and my flams? And I'm like, you know what? I want to put sand on my Gretchen bases. And so I go find the Gretchen and I go find the sand and I go find the glue. And then I get about three of them done. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go play video games. <laughs> So I bought myself a little whiteboard and on this whiteboard, I wrote down all of my most pressing hobby needs. Like what are the army lists that I'm currently playing with? What are the things on my hobby desk that need to get finished and off of my hobby desk? And so now when I sit down, I can look at my list and I can say that is the next step. And now with that whiteboard, I actually have a plan. And it's also actually helped me, stopped me from buying certain models because I was, you know, every now and then you open Amazon because you're like, you know, I really do need some more glue. And while I'm here, I might as well look at the Malifaux. But I stopped myself because the Malifaux is not on the whiteboard. Black Templar Impulsors are on the whiteboard. So I have to put that aside and I have to break back out the Impulsors and I have to actually get those guys finished because the whiteboard says so. It's a super simple. It was a couple of bucks. And it's actually helped a lot and makes me feel like I'm actually making progress. If I get to wipe something off of that whiteboard before bed, it feels really, really good. As opposed to just leaving myself a mess of Gretchen and sand for the next morning to deal with. Those were all of like the tools I've purchased this year that have changed the way I hobby and have, have become a part of my arsenal of equipment that I use to get things done. Some actual materials though that I've added into my roster that really surprised me this year Ultra thin super glue. I don't know how I lived without this for so, so many years. It is magical. A little risky and a little dangerous because if it gets hot or if you just put on a ton, sometimes like the fumes can get a little much or it can frost pretty badly, but it's so powerful and useful. I'm always putting cork on bases and the ultra thin super glue it sucks into the cork so fast and it dries so quickly as opposed to regular old glue. It's so nice. Dripping it onto cat litter instantaneously creates like resin hard material buildup on the base. I've been using it for models. Oftentimes, sometimes older Games Workshop vehicles will go together really poorly and you have to just hold there clamping it with your hands and you can't really get like a real clamp on there because it's like a spindly chaos or imperial thing. And so you it has to be kind of delicate, but firm. You need a delicate but firm hand for some Space Marine kits. And it just a little drip of ultra thin super glue will find its way. It'll suck its way into the cracks and dry pretty darn quickly. It's just it's really, really good stuff. I would suggest getting a, a, a big bottle of ultra thin super glue that comes with extra tips, because especially if you're like me and you're not careful at all, that tip is going to get yucky and gunky. So being able to swap out for a new tip is really nice. But ultra thin super glue is amazing. It's so good. I've glued my fingers together all the time, but I did that all the time with normal super glue anyway. Once again, I'm just not a careful person. Ultra thin super glue, I use it every single day. I still have my normal glue and my plastic glue or my normal super glue and plastic glue, but ultra thin super glue for basing is incredible. And for models, it's just really good stuff. And another material that I bought that I was a little wary of was UV cure resin. Now, I, I've seen people do amazing things with UV cure resin, and I feel like I haven't pulled anything like that off. But what I do find it really useful for is a really quick way to build up material. I used it to make a clear shield for my Knight Lancer. I have used it to make some crystal clear ice bases, and I've used it a ton for just building up space. I, I recently took on a big magnetization project and a lot of the magnets were just kind of free floating. They, they weren't sunken into holes that I pre-drilled. And so I put I got the magnet right where I wanted it. And then I just poured the UV cure resin over it, poked it a little bit with a toothpick I took out of my shot glass on my desk and got it all perfect. And then you just blast it with the UV light for like a minute and then you're golden. It's really, really good stuff. It also Unlike kind of super glue or like milliput or green stuff, it's liquid, it settles. 
So you can actually kind of use it to drip it into things to strengthen them. If you've got like a joint that's not super great or super secure or the glue didn't have a lot to glue onto, you just drip a little UV cure resin in the crack and then you just harden it. It gets, it's a really, really strong connection point and it's really, really useful stuff. I'm going to keep playing with it and figuring out how to pull off like the beautiful, gorgeous things that people do with it. But just as a, like a utilitarian tool, it's really handy. I feel like that paired with the super, ultra thin super glue has really upped my hobby game this year. And now I feel like I can take on any sort of building challenge. Now, before I get to the purchases I probably shouldn't have made this year, I want to take a quick moment to talk about today's sponsor, Mini Wargaming. Mini Wargaming is running a new game found campaign for their exciting new tabletop universe, Ravaged Star. To go along with the previously released Veil Touched are two all new armies. They are the Amari, dwarves who fight on in the face of overwhelming threats from all around the galaxy, and the new Gorkorg, huge gene spliced monsters who carry out unending assaults on all their enemies. These brand new armies can now join the tabletop of Ravage Star with a whole lineup of high quality PVC miniatures to choose from. These miniatures are available through Titanic War Packs, each featuring dozens of models from the faction or factions of your choosing. Packs like the Gorkorg Massive Monstrosities Pack, which contains plenty of big beastie boys like the Scream Skitter and the awesome Razor Worm. Or the Amari's Champions, which contains over a dozen Royal Guard units and a few big mechs to fight off any opposing demons and monsters. There's also a starter set, the Siege of Ankar, for newcomers to Ravage Star that is great to split with a buddy and give access to both factions and everything needed to start playing the game. And there's also war packs featuring the Veil Touch miniatures from the previous campaign. If you pledge during this campaign, you'll get access to a free pack of elite miniatures, so don't miss out. This campaign is way too big to cover everything here, so click on the link below and head on over to the campaign over at Game Found today. The first negative I want to talk about and the first big chunk of money I wasted this year was on an airbrush. I love Badger airbrushes. They're nice and cheap here in the States. Replacement parts cost next to nothing and they work really well. They work really well for me. I've used Iwatas, I've used Harder and Steinbecks, and I feel like the like the Ultra Pro, all airbrushes are pretty darn good, but like those airbrushes like are like supposed to be really, really nice. And I almost feel like really nice isn't good for me because once again, I'm not careful. I'm very clumsy and I like to work really fast. And so I tend to clog those airbrushes or damage the airbrushes. And speaking of damaging an airbrush, every single day I use the Badger Anthem 155. It's a siphon feed airbrush. I use a cup on the side. It is phenomenal, an absolute workhorse. I have it fitted with a point five millimeter needle and nozzle, which is enormous. I could paint my house with this airbrush and I sort of do. My paint room is disgusting right now. There's been so much overspray, but I love that airbrush. It's super junky. I paint about 500 models a year and I clean my airbrush about twice a year. It's great. I can, I just know this airbrush like it's an extension of my hand. I can just feel what's happening in it. I can just, if, I, if I'm getting a little spitting or a little bit of a clog, I can just close my eyes. Pss, 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 pss. Okay, there's a little piece of paint, there's a little crumb in the southwest corner of the nozzle. And I just take the needle and I give it a little twist and I pull it out a little, psh, psh, sprays out, we're good to go. Don't need to clean it, don't need to take it apart. It's the perfect airbrush for me. But I do notice that it's harder to do super, super fine stuff. I can zenithal like nobody's business. I can lay down base coats, but uh, it was Space Marine eyes that I really couldn't do. Like getting a little bit of glow on specifically a Space Marine eye so I invested in a fine detail airbrush. I got the Badger Renegade Chrome, which is a very nice airbrush. It's got the smallest nozzle that you have ever seen. And I definitely baby it way more than my 155. It's a great little airbrush. I've been using it for a while and I can do space rain eyes. I can do anything with it. I could paint little tiny pen lines with it. It's fantastic, but it is a more delicate airbrush. One thing that I like to do, once again, because I'm not careful, is I like to pull the needle out the front when my paintbrush is really junky and I need to clean it. I like to pull it out the front just so that I don't end up squeegeeing a bunch of paint into the mechanics of the airbrush. So I pull it out the front with a little pair of tweezers. I accidentally grabbed the tube that the nozzle sits uh, seats into and I pinched it and I squished it. And in, in a split second, I KO'd the entire airbrush because that nozzle has to fit into the tube perfectly to create a seal for the airbrush to work. 
And I did ream it out with a paper clip and I tried to fix it up. It looks like it would work, but it's that seal is destroyed. So I think I have discovered something about myself that it, I think I could. I can, now that I know that that is a very, very fragile part of the airbrush, I, I did buy another one. So I know that that's gonna, that's a problem. I will probably break the new one too. I also have a Patriot 105 from Badger, which is a little bit more of a robust, like beginner style airbrush. So I'm gonna try putting some finer needle and nozzles into that and seeing if I can use that to do Space Marine eyes and some more delicate detail work. And then maybe I'll just like keep the Renegade Chrome for only inks, like only ink highlighting. But yeah, airbrushes, it, airbrushes are pricey and you do sort of have to experience them to know if it's the perfect airbrush for you. Although if you're a messy slob like me, get the, uh, get the 155 Anthem. It's really, really good. Another hobby purchase that I made that I am no longer in love with is I have a little handheld vacuum and I love this thing. It, it sucks. But the problem is that it's currently not sucking, which is a problem. <laughs> It's a very cheap handheld vacuum unit and right out of the box, it worked like a charm, but very, very quickly, the filter that it came with got completely filled up with particulate and resin dust and paint dust. And so I took that out and I put in another filter and that one almost immediately clogged too. So I think when it comes to vacuums, probably a little bit like the Vortex Mixer, it's probably better to actually spend some cash on something like that because it was great. I used it every day. I would vacuum my desk anytime. I'm like, oh, look, I sanded. I sanded this guy's arm a little bit and there's a little bit of crumb on my face. Like I would just get the vacuum right out, clean my desk up. It felt nice to have my space clean. But since it stopped working, because now it sucks, <laughs> I my desk is a complete mess and I, I should invest in a better vacuum because I miss it. I miss my little handheld vacuum, but it's broken. So I should have I should have uh, saved up and spent just a little bit more cash. And speaking of things I spent a little bit too much cash on, it wasn't a big purchase, but I bought something that I was really excited to buy, Super Glue Accelerator. I love Super Glue. I always have Super Glue and Plastic Glue on my desk. I, I use them both constantly. And I thought Super Glue Accelerator was going to like change the way I glue because I thought I could put something together little shot of accelerator and then it's done. But it number one, that's not really true. And it's not the reason I don't use the product anymore. The really, the problem is a super glue bond needs to be incredibly tight. You need to get all of the air out of there for the paint to cure and hold securely. You can get um, thick super glue or chunky super glue, like gel, gel super glue. And you can use that and it will kind of create extra part particulate and extra material in between to make a stronger bond, but it's still not a super strong bond for stuff like that. I do like to use kind of thick um, plastic cement, but it can only cure what the spray can actually hit. So if I glue an arm on, it only is curing the very tiny line of exposed glue on the edge of the arm. And that's sometimes enough to hold it, but I've definitely spritzed something and then instantly moved on and then broken the piece right off because the glue inside of the joint didn't dry at all and it stinks. The fumes coming off the accelerant is horrible. It smells like death. It fills up my basement so quickly and lingers. I can't spray it. And it's not useful enough that I would actually take the project outside to spray it. So it's kind of just, I, I gave it maybe 10 sprays and I don't think I'm gonna spray anymore because it's just kind of a nasty, nasty stuff to work with. It's really disappointing because it sounds awesome. It sounds like it just makes gluing even easier than super glue already makes it. But overall, I have not been having any success with super glue accelerator. It's just kind of eh. But you know, it's never eh. That's right, our Patreon. Over there, we have a brand new STL set every single month. This month, we have the shipping hub an absolutely gigantic set of terrain featuring a monstrous crane, functional shipping containers, elevators, and stairs. We also make extra episodes of Eons of Battle where we take a look at our viewers' miniatures and give some ideas and critiques of how to improve their painting. And we have a tier you can get your name on one of my Black Templar Space Marines and you can join the crusade. Please let me know in the comments below what are some hobby purchases that you made this year that you are absolutely in love with and which ones that you kind of wish that you had never pulled the trigger on. I would love to know, and as always, thanks for watching.